Right, this one's going to be further exposure of the lies told around the Abu Dhabi fix. Um, but just before getting into it, the number of subscribers to this channel has increased by about, around about 150 or so over the last fortnight. Um, so thank you to the people who have subscribed. Appreciate it. And my continued thanks to those that have um, been following the channel right from the beginning. Um, if you are new to the channel, the purpose of the channel is to document the categoric systematic fix of the 2021 season, primarily focusing on what took place in Abu Dhabi, but we can evidence the season-long narrative. Um, hence, some of these more recent videos exposing what we saw go on throughout the season. Now, um, videos to look back on, which are key, which you will not C being presented by the rest of the media. Uh, there's one here. Um, I'm trying to highlight why uh, lap 58 is totally invalid. Um, hashtag um, void lap 58. If you haven't already done so, please watch that one because um, it tells you all the reasons why you cannot restart racing with lapped cars left in situ. They proposed that as a possible scenario of restarting lap 58 of Abu Dhabi by leaving the lapped cars in place. And it is absolutely not possible. The rules do not permit it. And yet the likes of Brundall and Chandok pretend that that was a possibility. You categorically can't do it. And none of the media discloses that fact. So check that video out, that proves it 100% and it proves how all the drivers were affected by it, okay? Um, the real safety car rules and why, and this is the other key, they don't explain why the rules are what they are, okay? Um, and there's a reason why they don't explain. Because if they explained it, you'd realise the nature of the fix. Um, so if you haven't already seen them, please check them two out. And whilst um, the most recent video uh, focuses on Karun Chandok, and this one does as well, Martin Brundle and David Croft are, are the main protagonists in actually narrating the fix real time. So all the way back here, there's one with uh, Crofty and there's the Brundle um, uh, the 13th of December where he does his analysis the day after the event I go through them and then I've redone the Brundle one more recently um, which is back up here this one here okay hour and 12 minutes long but you will see the out and out lies that Brundle is saying um, and it, it, all, it's, all it is entirely designed to do is to condition people to believe the narrative it's entirely lies. Um, so there are ones for you to check out. And please check out the other videos as and when you get the chance. Um, but please, you know, they're ones to, to take you take a first look at. And you will then realise just how fixed Abu Dhabi was. And the fact that you've not heard what I'm saying expressed by any other media should start opening your eyes to what's truly going on here. Anyway, this video, um, it's another analysis of Karun Chandok. So, this one is um, an article attributed to Karun Chandok on the Sky Sports website. So, this is the main Sky Sports website. Um, so, we start off with an advert, because that's what media is all about. It's all about making money. And then in F1 News, we have... The article by Karun Chandok, and it's here, the F1 expert. Now, if somebody is described as an expert, that means they know their subject. That means you could ask them a question about that subject, and they should be able to answer you. Because they've got a level of expertise, they should be able to give you the answer to your question. That's what it is to be an expert. That's quite simple, isn't it? Let's go through what Karun Chandok has to say, and then I'm going to play you the video that's uh, incorporated within this article. 
at the end and we'll go through that too. So here it goes. Abu Dhabi GP, Karun Chandok on the controversial finish to Max Verstappen, Lewis Hamilton's epic F1 title duel. Now bearing in mind, this is a dedicated sports channel. If you are teaching children or coaching children um, and encouraging them to play or participate in sport, you try to teach them and nurture them with the values of sporting ethics, sporting values, sporting integrity, um, the notion of respecting yourself and respecting your opponent to try and compete to get the best out of yourself, but to also uh, recognize, value and respect the quality of your opponent and their accomplishments too. Sporting ethics are ethics that should translate into values that people should have in life. They're extremely important. This is a sports, dedicated sports channel. And look at the slant that they're putting on it to actually validate something that was entirely corrupt. And let's be clear, the true champion was cheated, robbed out of their valid accomplishment. There is and never will be any excuse for that. Nothing will ever excuse what was done to Lewis Hamilton on that day. And this is a dedicated sports channel validating it. Now we're going to go through what you had to say. Um, just drag this down. Okay. In a Monday reflection on a tense and ultimately contentious end to a season like no other, <laughs> a season like no other, Sky F1's Karun Chandok examines the big, um, the big call that race control and Michael Massey had to make, and why, after pushing each other all year, neither Verstappen nor Hamilton deserved to lose. So this, we use the word deserved, we see that all the time. In sport, there is a winner and a loser, and that is, that's happened in sport, that's, no, that's known, okay? You know, in, in a league season, you get draws, but ultimately, at the end of the league season, there is a winner, okay? Somebody tops the table. So, that's the way it goes. Um... And the winner is the person who validly accomplishes the preset criteria of accumulating the most amount of points. So straight away, um, there is this, um, it's, it's softening the impact of what truly took place by this notion of deserved and neither deserved to lose. Okay. Um, we'll go through that video. But we'll go through the text first. That was the craziest final 10 minutes to a Formula One championship season that I can remember. That's a quote from the video. For decades to come, anyone who was in Abu Dhabi will be telling their grandchildren that we were there to witness an extraordinary weekend of intense battling between two supreme, supremely talented drivers after one of the greatest seasons in F1 history. Remember back to that weekend, because many of us tuned into that event in the prospect, many of us in the hope that we would be witnessing history and that we would be witnessing Sir Lewis Hamilton win his record-breaking eighth world title, over overtaking Michael Schumacher's record of seven. Many people were hoping that that's what they would see. There were some people that were hoping for the other outcome, okay? But many of us were hoping that we would witness history. There is no mention of that. That's the sort of thing we should be talking about in future. But there is no mention of it. What happened at, at race end 
and what could have been possible alternatives. What happened at race end and what could have been possible alternatives. So where is the description of what took place? Where is the um, where is it categorically stated as to why it was so wrong that what took place was so wrong? There's no explanation of it. Let's start with the finish because that's what everybody wants to hear about. And we've got another advert. And this time the advert is for Sky Bet. Now, if you're betting on sport and that sport is rigged, then you've been defrauded. So if the sport becomes fixed, you have become defrauded because you've placed a bet and they've changed the goalposts. They've, they've carried out this sport not in accordance with the rules of the sport and that skewed the outcome. You've been defrauded. It's quite simple. Quite ironic that we've got an advert for Skybet on this write-up of this event, isn't it, really? So, the expert, Karun Chandok, the expert that can answer the questions because he's got that level of expertise, the man that can explain what's going on, says this. In my view, the whole thing seemed a bit confusing with the message first that lapped cars will not be allowed to overtake the safety car, followed by the message to just the five cars between Lewis and Max being told to pass. So in, in Karun's view, it's confusing. Why is it confusing, Karun? Is that a valid instruction? You're not explaining any of this, are you? All you're doing, once again, is putting forward the narrative of, of oh, it's all a bit complicated. You know, we were all a bit confused. None of us particularly knew what was going on because it all happened so quickly. It was all a bit of a muddle. Oh, clumsy Michael Massey. He all got all got it wrong under pressure because people were on the, on the radio to him, asking him to do this, asking him to do that. And he just kind of went, oh, don't know what I'm doing. Don't know what I'm doing. And, and it all got a little bit messed up, didn't it? That's the narrative they want you to believe. That's the narrative that every form of media has presented. And that's not the truth. Because they don't tell you the implications of the rules. They don't tell you that you've been lied to about the rules. And consequently, they just want to fob this off and let it go. Oh, move on, move on, move on. So, firstly, confusing that lapped cars will not be allowed to overtake the safety car. And quite simply, in order to restart racing, the lapped cars have to be released. And then they have to be given at least one mandatory safety car lap with which to be afforded the opportunity to recapture the back of the pack. That's explained in my other videos and the reasons are explained why. Simply, Norris, who was in eighth at the position at the at the deployment of the safety car, it, that became seventh when Perez retired mysteriously. Again, there's videos about that. Norris was in eighth position. Gasly in seventh at the time was uh, less than twelve seconds up the road from Norris, but at the deployment of the safety car, Gasly gets to disappear off around the track and join the back of the safety car snake. You cannot restart racing like that, leaving Norris virtually an entire lap behind Gasly. That is totally against sporting fairness to every competitor in that race. You cannot allow a safety incident to affect all the different competitors like that in such different ways. If some competitors are allowed to close up with the car that they're supposed to be competing with, you can't allow other competitors to lose the best part of a lap on the guy that they're supposed to be competing with. Okay, the same parameters have to apply to all drivers. That is the FIA International Sporting Code. That covers it in that. And all of the sporting regulations are underpinned by the FIA International Sporting Code. They don't tell you this. There's a reason they don't tell you this. 
Because if they told you that, the true scale of the fix would become evident and everybody would understand it. Their responsibility as a sports broadcaster is to educate fans and followers of the sport. Instead, so in any of the, th the sport that you follow, they teach you, they explain the rules. If this changes to the rules, the pundits, the commentators, they explain it. They explain what's going on. In Formula One, they don't. The reason they don't is they want to present to you that it's all so confusing. There's that many grey areas in Formula One where this could potentially happen, that could potentially happen, another thing can potentially happen. And that's not true. It's all done by design so that they can get away with what they did. That's a fact. OK, that is what has happened. So rather than highlight that. Rather than explain any of that to the, the readers or to the viewers on the videos, he quickly goes past that. Okay, we don't we don't focus on that. We focus on the drama and the excitement and fake alternatives. Okay, so that effectively handed the championship to Max as he had the fresh soft tyres while Lewis was on well -worn, a well-worn set of hard ones and therefore had little chance to fight back. So the focus becomes on the tyres. And the reality is the tyres are an irrelevance. The reality is that race should have ended behind the safety car and it does not matter what tyres you are on in safety car conditions, because if you're not going to restart racing again, all them tyres have to do is get you to the end of the race. Because it doesn't matter what their capabilities are in terms of lap time, as long as they can keep you going behind that safety car until the end of the race, it doesn't matter. But once again, they try and gaslight fans into believing that the tyres are the significant factor here. Not at all. The significant factor is the, the cheat. The significant factor is that decision to, to just obliterate the rules, not follow the rules, to set up that last lap shootout in which then tyres then became that factor. But had the rules been followed, tyres are nothing to do with it. So again, we'll, we'll skip by another video clip. Last lap drama. From Christian Horner's camp, just what you all want to see. Another advert. So, Karun Chandok, this is the expert at the top. Karun Chandok, this is what he is telling people. I think you keep telling us what you think, Karun. Okay, rather than give us the expertise of a expert, because... Let's face it, if you know your subject, if you are a university professor, a lecturer, you know what you're talking about. It, you don't tell people what you think. You tell people what it is. OK, but you keep telling us what you think, Karun. OK, I think a fairer and still very exciting. See, this focus on very exciting would have been either. OK, either. So instead of seeing what we did see, which you've not focused on and not exposed the true reality of, you're now diverting us to other alternatives, aren't you, Karun? A. Red flag the race when Nicholas Latifi crashed and then have a four-lap sprint to the flag with everyone on fresh tyres. OK, let's go through that, Karun. In any other race of the season, with such an incident, would the red flag have come out? And the simple answer is categorically no. The times we saw a red flag were, I believe it was Saudi. And the reason they red flagged it, they tell us, is that the barrier was damaged. And the amount of time taken to repair that barrier to ensure that the track was safe again would have taken a prolonged period so they red flag it. In this situation, the barrier wasn't damaged and it could be cleared up in a what would be deemed a normal timescale for that sort of incident. And therefore, the safety car 
would be the correct way to deal with that incident. So your suggestion of what you think would be fairer of red flagging that race isn't in accordance with the rules of the sport and the, the way that they deal with such incidents. So I don't care what you think. As an expert, you should be saying to people that wasn't a applicable option. But you've suggested it there. You suggested it there for people to debate over in the comments section, because whilst people are debating, whilst people are at war with one another in the comments section, there are more clicks, there are more money associated with the advertising revenue that comes from them clicks. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. Listen, watch, argue, keep people engaged. That's what it's all about. Or B. B. Leave the lapped cars in between Lewis and Max so there would have been more of a contest on the final lap because I think Max would have passed the lapped cars in the first half of the lap and then been attacking Lewis in the second half. That's all Right, I'll try not to swear too much, but I, you've got, I've got to be clear on this. That is all utter bollocks. I can't say it. I have to say it with that level of strength. It's utter bollocks. You are not allowed to resume racing with lapped cars in situ. It fixes outcomes. Okay, it fixes outcomes and it goes against the FIA International Sporting Code of Sporting Fairness to every competitor in that event. So the very notion is a lie, um, which he doesn't explain. Instead, they are proposing it as an option and it never is an option. Even in the regulations, it says if it is safe to do so, the lapped cars will be told, any lapped cars will be told, you know, to pass a safety car and off they go, right? Which means if it's not safe to do so, it's not safe to go racing. It doesn't mean if it's not safe to release the lapped cars, you just start racing with them in situ. It doesn't mean that at all. It says if it is safe to do so, they get released. It's a safety measure that you, you lap behind the safety car and once that safety precaution is, is declared safe, you go through the procedures in order to resume racing in a fair manner to every single competitor in that event. And nobody explains it that way. They pretend that it is possible to resume racing with lapped cars in situ and it categorically isn't. Uh, but even, right, so we know that that's not true, but then it, Look at how he expands upon that lie to almost embellish the lie. He says, more of a contest because I think, and this is you again thinking as the expert. So this is your expertise. When you cross the line to start, a, let's say, let's say, let's imagine this fake scenario happening. Lewis Hamilton crosses the line and then five cars cross the line and then Max Verstappen crosses the line okay so Lewis Hamilton is at full speed crossing the line and then at approximately the normal gaps between cup competitors as they cross the start finish line on resumption of racing is half a second okay so Max Verstappen is six cars back. So he's three seconds behind Lewis at the start of the lap. When you are overtaking back markers, even if they've got blue flags, you are slowed down. You're not putting in a qualifying lap time because you're, you're not necessarily taking the optimum line around the track. You can overtake that down the straights, but when you get to a corner, you generally tuck in and then wait till the next straight before blasting past a couple of more cars. By which time, Lewis Hamilton will be extending that lead from three seconds to well above that. So if he's passed all these cars by half a lap, how many seconds behind is he by that point in time? 
And when we get past turn nine, it's a twisty section where you're not going to overtake around that circuit anyway. So that's an entire fictitious situation, all made up. And this is the expert presenting that as a possibility. Um, and then again, I'll pick up the text to bring out a red flag because of all the procedures involved would have needed race director Michael Massey to almost pre-decide that if a car crashes at turn 14, we call a red flag. And clearly that wasn't the case. Look at him saying the race director would have had to pre-decide that he was going to bring out a red flag. What are you saying, man? What are you saying? You have to premeditate that if there's an accident, you're going to red flag it. Get your head around that, everybody. It, that is ridiculous. When any incident occurs in sport, you judge it on its merits and you react to it in the appropriate way. You cannot predetermine your response to something when you don't even know what's happened. So when we get to the video, you'll see more of this. But you cannot predetermine your response. Will you red flag it if, it's, if uh, there's a crash at turn 14? Well, we don't know. If the driver looks like he's injured and needs um, an ambulance on the track, yeah. If the barrier is um, d severely damaged and it's going to take time, yeah. If there's debris over the entire width of the track so that the cars can't safely get through without risk of puncture or, you know, hitting one another because it's so tight, yeah. If the safety of the marshals is such that even by lapping behind the safety car, the marshals aren't safe, yeah. But you don't know any of that until the incident is, is actually occurs. So you cannot deter predetermine your response to it. This is the expert proposing these things to fans, getting fans to believe these are possibilities and options. It's obscene. Um, in a normal race weekend, a safety car uh, call would have been totally expected. <laughs> well, there you go. So he does litter it with truth now and again. I also think... The race would have just carried on under the safety car until the finish with Lewis in front. You think this. This is what you think. So some of the things you think are the truth. But the other things you think, Karun, are utter lies. So this bit's the truth. But rather than present it as a thought, why don't you present this as a statement of fact? In a normal race weekend, a safety car would have been totally expected. I also think the race would have just carried it on under safety car until the finish with Lewis in front. So it would have been a safety car. Finish, Karun. That's exactly what would have happened. 100%. It would have been a safety car finish. But then, but this wasn't a normal race. And it does feel like there was a real des desire understandably again so he's projecting that he finds it understandable to finish this great season under green flag racing conditions what are you doing there is no final to a formula one season this is a fixture in a league season every grand prix counts it is a Grand Prix. So what happens at Grand Prix 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 15, 20, 22 is the same. OK, we've now got sprint weekends and, and that bullshit. But it is the same. You have a race. You don't get to the last one and go, oh, now this one's the final. So we do things differently here. It's like you don't get to the last game of the football league season and say, oh, um, Man City are, are drawing one all this game. Um, but actually, they need a win to uh, to make sure they win the, the, uh, the championship. Let's decide this game with a penalty shootout, shall we? It's not allowed. 
That's not the way it works. So why are you presenting this as not being a normal race weekend, Karun? The expert, what are you doing? Most people are, are listening to this now. No, they know the truth. OK, this is the lies being presented by the media that condition a lot of people to believe this, to believe these possibilities, to agree with it. Especially these people that the trolls on this page now on the, on this channel now that they wanted Max Verstappen to win. So they're happy with the outcome. So they think that they've got validation in saying what they're saying. They can't bring themselves to even even question what I'm saying here. Open your eyes and look at the bullshit that's in front of you. It's not possible, and yet Chandok is saying this. Brundle has been saying this all along. Crofty is saying this. Every single Sky Sports employee that gets interviewed and has to give their opinion about it says the same bullshit. It's all bullshit. This doesn't happen by chance. This is a corrupt broadcaster broadcasting a narrative that they are paid to present. It is totally disgusting. Um, so, again, yeah, more adverts, more adverts. Mercedes are clearly not letting this go. So, again, he's going, oh, but Mercedes, the victims, are challenging this. Right? What you're doing, you're, you're dividing. Oh, but but they're not happy with this. None of you should be happy. Nobody should be happy about this. This, a human being, got done. Right? They were robbed of their valid accomplishment. That accomplishment was historic. That was them going down in history of being the first person to ever accomplish that feat. That's massive. They've been robbed of that. We should never, ever lose sight of that. That is disgusting. And look, where's the mention of this? Where is the mention of that? Mercedes are clearly not letting go and have lodged an intention to appeal the result and potentially take it to the higher judicial levels within the FIA. Well, the FIA is corrupt. OK, so if you go and complain to the FIA about the FIA like they did in the stewards appeal and the corruption that was there, which I've done the videos about. And I can even see them taking it to court, which will be a shame for the image of the sport after this incredible season. It would be a shame. That's you projecting, isn't it? It's you conditioning the narrative. You know, because I don't think it would be a shame. I think it's an absolute necessity that all this is exposed. It's an absolute necessity that justice is done. It's an absolute necessity that the true winner is recognised for their valid accomplishment. None of that is a shame. And as for the image of the sport, you need to be exposed, all of you, for exactly what you are. But you care about the image of the sport because what you have done, you have care. All you care about is the money that is linked to the sport. You created the fake drama to attract more fans. The more fans, the more money. Simple as that. Because the more fans, the more global exposure for each of these brands that wants to advertise in Formula One. Hence, the money you charge to each of these brands for advertising becomes much greater. And that applies to so many things surrounding the sport, TV packages, everything. All of the, the revenue increases, the value of the sport increases, the value of each team increases, Liberty Media, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. So the share value, the total holding increase from 9 billion US dollars to 13.8 billion US dollars in the 2021 season. That's significant. That does not happen by chance. It happens by design. Chandok carries on. 
While I can 100% sympathise with Lewis and Mercedes, because until lap 52, they had the title in their pocket. You're missing the bit. Lewis Wood was on course to become an eight-time world champion. A record-breaking eight-time world champion. Whilst you can sympathise, you've got no concept of that, Karun, because you've got no concept of what it feels like to win <laughs> or be anywhere near winning a championship of that magnitude. OK, I just don't see how the result can get overturned because ultimately the race ran to its full distance and the result was declared. So what are you doing now? Once again, you're directing people. You're directing people about possibilities and this this. Mm, well, it got to the end, so we can't overturn it now. How many Olympic events? have got to the end and somebody was awarded a gold medal for supposedly winning winning it and then later got disqualified that happens in sport how many sporting teams or competitors have been retrospectively disqualified when things were found out to be wrong whether that be, be cheating through drugs or any other form of cheating or corruption. It happens. But you're saying you don't see how it can be. You're being paid to say that. And look at this. This is absolute, absolute smokescreen. Are they going to take Carlos Sainz's podium away? Well, hang on a minute. Behind the, po behind the safety car, Carlos Sainz was winning in third. The race finishes behind the safety car, as it should. Carlos Sainz finishes in third. Where is this notion of taking Carlos Sainz's podium away? So what you're doing is gaslighting. You're presenting to fans, oh yeah, well you can't take, well you're not going to, are you? Or Yuki Tsunoda's fourth place on countback. Well no, you know what, if it's a safety car finish, you can't overtake. And therefore... Yuki Tsunoda, you were in sixth place, or no, what were you in? I think you were in fifth place. So I think it was Bottas in fourth, Tsunoda in fifth. So Tsunoda, you were in fifth place behind the safety car. You can't overtake anybody. The race finished behind the safety car, you finished fifth. Well done. I think it's still probably your highest finish in Formula One. Okay, well done. But you just don't get to, to gain that extra place because... That's not allowed to happen because it's not a racing lap. What's the issue? There isn't an issue. That's what happens. They're the rules of the sport. Why are you presenting that Yuki Tsunoda would be hard done by were they to revert the result to what it needs to be? Ridiculous. Um, the whole weekend was super intense. Oh, my God. I was particularly nervous as I had been part of the design team who had done the reconfiguration of the Yas Marina circuit and now all of a sudden it was going to have millions of eyes on it for the most high profile race in F1 history. Okay, the most high profile race in F1 history. Millions of eyes on it. See, see what it does to the sport. Extra value. Lewis started off the weekend saying he thought the track would suit Mercedes. And Red Bull's Christian Horner jumped on that bank. At, well, that's not for the first time, Christian Horner. Incitement. All through free practice, um, taking little digs about how I was helping Mercedes. It was obviously a joke because of the track design um, started a year ago and was signed off in the spring this year, a long time before anyone knew what sort of track would suit each car. Christian and I knew he was saying it in jest, but the Max super fans. And the clickbait media, the clickbait media, who are they? Who are they? Went mad on Friday as if I was some form of Mercedes employee. So what you're doing now is again gaslighting. You are projecting that, oh, oh, they're saying on this. But we all know you are actually linked with Red Bull and doing the opposite. Mind you. When Max took pole on Saturday, I didn't hear any thanks from Christian about the final sector of the tracksuit in their car superbly. Look at the way they gush about Max. Max's qualifying lap 
was absolutely sublime. Max's qualifying lap was absolutely sublime. If you ever want an example of a young sportsman capable of soaking up pressure on the biggest weekend of his career, that was it. It was inch perfect and Lewis had no answer for that. <sighs> Look at the way he gushes about Max Verstappen. The guy in a clear car that's clearly fast over one lap and over a few laps took pole position. Well done. But a Grand Prix is contested over the duration of 312 kilometres or whatever it is. In this situation, 58 laps. So it's not about setting your car up to be fast just for one lap. It's about setting it up so that it can sustain a high pace, consider the tyre wear, consider your strategy, your fuel consumption, your ability to sustain lap after lap after lap. Okay? Because that is what wins you a Grand Prix. Not just one lap being able to go around the track once really fast. But look how he describes Max Verstappen. But come the start of the race, the, Mer the Mercedes launched into the lead. It wasn't Lewis's ability to actually launch his car off the line. Okay? But come the start of the race, the Mercedes launched into the lead. And the battle down to turn six was pretty tasty. This, this is Karun thinking again. You need to stop thinking, Karun, because that's when it all goes wrong. I personally think that Lewis left a gap, which Max was able to go for, and also, crucially, he stopped the car in time to make the corner. If Max could slow down enough, then Lewis could have also done so, and therefore, I think he should have been given the place back to Max. So you're validating the dive bomb again. You're not mentioning that at the braking zone to that corner, Lewis was clearly ahead, Max was behind his car. He wasn't even like level with the rear wheel. He was definitely not halfway alongside, which you would have had to have been in order to be, be in top 20 space at that corner. But instead, he dive bombed Lewis Hamilton. Understeer, understeer, understeer. And he basically pushed it, forced him off track. You're not allowed to do that. Instead, you're validating again. Either way, as we saw in the previous three races, once again, the Mercedes was clearly the faster car in terms of race pace. So it's the Mercedes again. So all this you told us about Max Verstappen's qualifying performance. What have you said about Lewis Hamilton's mastery in building up that lead in the Grand Prix? In the event that mattered. In the thing you are contesting. Because this is what we're contesting in Formula 1. Who is the best over a Grand Prix? And it, if you keep saying the Mercedes, well, if the Mercedes was that good, where's Bottas? In the other Mercedes, which is so fast. Because he's not extracting the same pace that Lewis Hamilton is. Lap after lap after lap building up the lead and making sure them tyres are still capable of going lap after lap after lap. <sighs> Brazil, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi all have very, different, uh, have very different circuits, but on all four tracks, the Mercedes had superior speed on Sundays. Again, tell us where Valtteri Bottas was in each of those races. And... On the Sunday, superior speed on the Sundays. Is that anything to do with the two days of um, free practice? The Friday practice. What's Lewis Hamilton doing with his car? Is he going out there looking to be the fastest on the timesheet in free practice? Or is he going out there, getting the feel for his car, working out how he wants to set his car up to actually compete in the Grand Prix? There's a level of mastery and genius in doing that. 
And therefore, no, there is no doubt that when we come to the Grand Prix, he has optimised that car to perform in the Grand Prix. That's where, that's where you use intelligence. That's your brain. Why are you not explaining this to people? Instead, you're just saying, oh, that's the car. That's the car. And this season, oh, we're seeing Max. We're seeing the greatest driver of all time, aren't we, this season with Max? Max is so great. You're not highlighting that the Red Bull car is 30 mile an hour faster than everything else and could just breeze past everything because the Mercedes didn't have that pace advantage in 2021. That's for sure. Because even when it got fitted with this so-called super engine, which was not a super engine, it was just that they knew that the engine only had to last them four races, not even that, as opposed to the normal six or eight. So they probably just ran a different map, which means it wouldn't last as long, but didn't need to. Right. So. What that did in them races was give him a bit more pace than normal, but you saw them overtakes that Hamilton was making. You look at Brazil, Hamilton wasn't six car lengths ahead of Verstappen before going into the, the corner. That only just gave him the pace to overtake Verstappen. Only just. And then Verstappen would still send it up the inside and try and crush him out of the race. Um, I think even if Lewis had given the place back to Max, he would have passed him quite quickly after that. The trouble is, as we know, you try passing Max Verstappen, he will run you off the track. You risk crashing out. We're in a situation where had Max Verstappen have crashed Lewis Hamilton out of that race, Max Verstappen would have been the champion because of the Belgian parade victory. So Max Verstappen was, would have been quite content to do that. In the end, the gap just grew steadily and despite Sergio Perez's best efforts, it never really looked like Max was going to challenge Lewis until the final lap. Sergio Perez's best efforts. Right. I want you to think of um, any form of racing, uh, but particularly think of this. Well, you can think of cycling, right? You can think of cycling, uh, something like the Tour de France, and you have teams there. You might have teams of eight riders, and let's say the lead rider of two different teams uh, are racing off for the yellow jersey. Um. And let's say um, Team Ineos, let's say their lead rider is one of the contenders and let's say another team has got their contender. Are the seven riders from Team Ineos allowed to act as blockers to try and block off the rider, the comp competing rider from another team? I don't think they are. Imagine athletics. We see events like the 10,000 metres. And generally, these events, I mean, we we had Mo Farah, um, Sir Mo Farah from the UK competing in that and was very successful. But generally, uh, these events are dominated by the African nations, um, the Kenyans, the Ethiopians. And they do run as a team. You've got three or four athletes from each of them, them teams. Imagine you've got four Kenyans at the front and an Ethiopian athlete. And the lead Kenyan starts making a break for it. And the other three Kenyans are there trying to block out the Ethiopian. Purposefully try and slow him down. Purposefully try and impede him. Would that be okay? And yet all of the media has almost made Sergio Perez this god of defence. When have you ever seen that sort of thing happen in Formula One before? Because I can't recall a driver purposefully driving like that, purposefully holding back somebody in such a manner in Formula One like that. You still have to be competing yourself with them and he he did everything he could to take as much time out of another driver's race as possible now i'm going to check the international sporting code to see where we, we stand with that but look at the sporting implications you, you can't have one of your team act as a linebacker to um, hold back another competitor that's not what it's about is it 
not what it's about. Right. Um, coming down. Neither driver deserved to lose the world championship. <sighs> deserved again. To lose. What are we talking about? We're being robbed of an eighth world championship. They have both been driving on such a consistently high level despite the pressure of the title battle. Max scored a record 80. Again, they were coming up with bullshit statistic now to validate. Because the number of podiums is irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is how many points do you accumulate in the entire season? That's the only thing that's relevant. And if there's a tie on number of points, then who wins the most amount of races? And if the rules of the sport are followed, where there is no race in Belgium, that was a, a two-lap parade, there was no racing, there is no result there, because no sport took place there. So nobody wins Belgium, that gets scrubbed. We go into Abu Dhabi, level on eight race victories each, but Lewis Hamilton is ahead by five points. And then Lewis Hamilton wins the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Lewis Hamilton is the champion, it's as simple as that. Okay, but he goes on, record 18 podiums, and he didn't finish first or second uh, where he had incidents. Silverstone, well, that was Max's fault. Hungary, okay, got involved in a bit of a multi-car pilot. It happens. Monza, where Max took out Lewis, or a tire tire failure, that happens. That's happened to other drivers, okay. Issues with tires have prevented other drivers from winning championships. Lewis Hamilton himself back in 2007. Nigel Mansell back in about 86, 87 when his tyre blew out in um, Adelaide, I believe it was. These sorts of things happen. It's part of the sport. Lewis and Mercedes started the season on the back foot with a car that looked very tricky to drive, but they worked together as a team, dug themselves out of a hole and came to the final part of the season with the faster package. Lewis's victories in Bahrain and Brazil this year were amongst his best of all time. On the whole, this was a year where F1 won. F1 won. Really? It is the most corrupt event ever witnessed. And you consider that to be F1 winning. How did F1 win? F1 won because the Liberty Media's value in of F1 went from 9 billion to 14.8 billion. Winning! How did it do that? It did that by manufacturing drama. By the season going down to the last lap of the last Grand Prix. That didn't happen organically. Throughout that season, Max Verstappen was not penalised. Max Verstappen was guilty of numerous driving offences which were never penalised. In fact, he was just enabled to continue driving like that, to pick up as many points as possible because they wanted to create a new champion to this new rivalry because they didn't want Lewis Hamilton to win again and Mercedes to win again because that was boring. Having the same guy win the competition year in, year out because they're better, that's that's not good, that's not very interesting. So let's see if we can get somebody else to compete with them. Oh, well, there is this guy, but, yeah, he keeps throwing up the insider. If we penalise that, though, it'll mean that he won't get the points to win. So, oh, yeah, just let him do that. Just let him get away with that. Get Let him get as many points as possible. Oh, shit, Lewis is coming back now. Lewis has come all the way back. We thought we were going to get a new champion, and Lewis and Mercedes have managed to, to still, despite all that we've done, still come back and win. Shit, what are we going to do now? There was a a pre-plan. There was a pre-plan, and I'll show you where the pre-plan was, but that'll be in another video. The action on track was real high-quality stuff. No, it wasn't. It contravened driving standards totally. Punctuated by controversial moments and drama, whilst the war of words between the team bosses off the track kept the headlines coming all season long. Christian Horner inciting the hatred inciting the hatred 
Right, I've um, scrolled back up to the first uh, video that was in the text and I'm just going to go through that as quickly as I can because I am mindful that this video has dragged on a bit. But you need to start picking through what you're seeing and identifying the true reality of it and how filthy it is. It is it's disgusting. And yet people just absorb it and accept it and just think it's normal. And it's not normal. It is absolutely not normal. There's no mention of the absolute robbery that got that, that, that took place. There's no mention when you're doing a write-up of the most disgusting sporting event ever to not not even touch upon the fact that somebody was robbed of their place in history. And then you've, you've, you, this expert is not explaining the rules, not explaining what was wrong with the decision, is making up other scenarios that were potentials that, oh, maybe if he'd have done this, it would have been a bit better if he'd done that, but he didn't. And that's, they're all just lies and bullshit. You, you have to see that this is a complete cover-up job. It's complete, um, it's human conditioning. It is Sky Sports presenting themselves as experts and giving their expert opinion, right, to make fans think this is what it is. And it's nothing like that. It is absolutely filthy. It's fraud, right? Each one of these people involved in this are involved in a fraud. It is absolutely... Uh, I've, I'm lost for words. And, well, the words I'd use aren't ones you want to hear. Anyway, let's listen to what he's got to say here. And I'm going to break a few things down because you need to listen. Thank you, Simon. It's taken a few minutes to just catch my breath. But let's try and unpack what happened in the last five lasses race. First of all, it all triggered here from Nicholas at TV having that crash on lap 53. Now, there were two things here that I thought of. One, they could have red flagged it. and ha Again, we've said that that's, that wasn't a val valid um, option because you wouldn't red flag it in any other Grand Prix of the season and therefore you wouldn't red flag it in this one. OK, so that's that one disproven. Had a standing start like we had in Saudi. However, Martin Brundle and I spoke to Michael Massey before the race and said, if there was an incident at turn 14 like Kimi had on Friday, which is basically the same as this, would you do a red flag? And he said, no, it would be a safety car. So do you not think that that's weird? Do you not think that the sporting, uh, the commentators on the sport asking the race director, oh, if there's another crash here like this in the race, will you red flag it? Bit strange, isn't it? Now, like I say, they also know these are supposed experts. These are people that know this sport inside out. You know you can't predetermine your response to an incident. So you wouldn't ask that question, would you? But now you're saying, well, once again, it's this fake validation. Let's tell the viewers that we had this conversation and he already said he wasn't going to do that. Well, the alarm bell should be ringing that that's a conversation that shouldn't even be taking place. Because you don't predetermine your response. Because it would have been a red flag had Latifi looked to be seriously injured and needed medical attention. It would have been a red flag had the barriers have been damaged and would have taken 20 minutes to repair. It would have been a red flag if the track wasn't passable. So you can't give an answer. And these people know this. But you're asking that question and then you're telling fans that you asked the question. What are you doing? Conditioning thought. Oh. That was pretty clear. Now, Hamilton, under the safety car, didn't pit. And the reason he didn't pit is Mercedes couldn't afford to bring him in. Because if they had, and Verstappen had got in front and not pitted, Lewis would have given up track position. And that was a huge risk for Mercedes, even if they would have had the new tyres. So why is that a huge risk? You don't, you're not going to tell us. It's a huge risk because, and what you needed to have said there, Karun, is because if that race would have ended behind the safety car, then the person that is leading 
is the winner. So you don't give up track position. But you don't make that explicit, do you, Karun? And Mercedes look, know the rules of the sport. Their strategies looked at the incident. They know the approximate time it takes for them incidents to be cleared up. And they decided that you don't want to lose track position in this situation because it's highly likely it's going to be a safety car finish and therefore you need to be on to remain in first position. And you win. Simple as that. But you don't state that, do you? You make it all about the tyres again. Verstappen and Red Bull, for them it was a free pit stop. They had a gap behind, it was a slam dunk, no-brainer, and they put on the soft tyres. So effectively, they were going to go out there for a one-lap quality run. Now, this is the moment where it all gets very controversial. You can understand why... Again, focus on this, because again, he's not focusing on the crux of the problem. Mercedes are aggrieved about this. So, these five cars, I'm just going to drop, pick them out here. You can see Ricardo, the two Alpines, and there, Leclerc, and Vettel. So, those five cars, sorry, not Ricardo, it's Norris, but those five cars were asked to pass Lewis Hamilton, who is here behind the safety car, and there's Max Verstappen. So, effectively, that's given Max a clear run to attack Lewis on the final lap. Now, what Mercedes are upset about, of course, is that the other cars behind, so that is Ricardo Stroll and Schumacher, weren't asked to pass. So they're saying, listen, hang on, all the cars should have been asked to pass, not just those. And, and effectively, from the FIA standpoint, I think if they'd waited for those three cars, we would not have had this final lap of racing, which I'm about to show you. OK. Ridiculous. OK, because he's trying to make out that actually it's it's... The, the release of those three cars would have determined whether or not we'd have got a final racing lap. Them cars were released at turn nine, approximately, on lap 57. A mandatory safety car lap has to be performed after the release of the lap cars. Number one, all of the lapped cars have to be released. And it was possible for those other three lapped cars to have made it past prior to start in the, crossing the start-finish line on lap 58. They would, it was possible to release them all on lap 57, OK? But regardless, lap 58 is the safety car lap. That lap to give them the chance of making it around the track and linking up with the back of the train so that Norris can have the chance of getting back on terms with Gasly in order to have that same competitive chance and you've not said that you've totally ignored the fact of the mandatory safety car lap that needs to be performed after the release of lapped cars and instead you've drawn people's focus to oh it was just the fact that these three weren't released is the problem because had we released the three we probably wouldn't have got the race you wouldn't have got the race anyway because it has to be a safety car lap and the other thing you've not identified is the fact that by leaving them in place, what you did, you left two two cars in between Verstappen and Sainz, meaning that Sainz, OK, he was on different tyres, he wasn't on the fresh sots, but Sainz was held back from challenging for a top two position. You cannot separate out two competitors in a sporting event to, to race off for the win. We go back to the example of athletics. In the men's 10,000 metre race, okay, with one lap to go, there might be a bunch of six athletes all competing for the win. You can't just pick out two of them and say, right, just you two are racing off for the win here. Can't do it. In cycling, Tour de France, you can't just separate out two competitors and go, right, just you two. The rest of you got to hold you back, okay, hold you back for a bit. Just you two, off you go, see who wins out of you two. You can't do it. Effectively, by leaving them two lapped cars in place, we'll move the five out of the way so you can race you. But them two, you stay there. You can hold back behind them two cars. Just let them two race off. You can't do that. And that's what you did. And so when Verstappen puts his dive bomb in, understeer, 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 disappears off the other side of the track and leaves a big gap up the inside, science, science can't go and nip through that, can he? Strange.
video, which was, of course, the most dramatic end to a world championship that we can imagine. So keep focusing on the drama. Max Verstappen on a brand, well, not brand new, but a scrub set of soft tyres, much fresher, of course, than the tyres that Hamilton had. And for Lewis, this must have been an awful feeling because he knew he was just a sitting duck. Verstappen so... He knew you were manipulating it. So much more grip. And to be honest, I agreed with Martin when he said in commentary, I didn't expect Verstappen to go for the move this early on. Look how far back he is. Because he's not entitled to, but watch this. Focus on Lewis Hamilton's steering. Because Karun Chandok points this out, but doesn't tell you what's wrong with it. But he's seen a gap. And he's absolutely dived into it. In fact, I'll just go back. Look at... I'm going to go back so you get to see this a few times. Look at Lewis Hamilton, what he has to do to avoid the collision. Going into that corner, Lewis Hamilton... Max Verstappen is well behind Hamilton going into that corner. Right? So Hamilton's got the line around that corner. You can't send it from that far back. And Lewis Hamilton has taken a wide line so that it gets him a good exit to get a good acceleration down the main straight so that Verstappen doesn't get a slip slipstream. So he's, he's he's already far enough ahead to have the right to the corner. Okay, He's then taking that corner in such a way so that he gets a good exit so hopefully then on the next straight Verstappen doesn't get near enough. But because Verstappen sends it, Lewis Hamilton has to deviate his line whilst he's halfway around the corner because a car has sent it and, and he's on a collision course for him. That is disgusting. Watch Hamilton's hands as he goes through the corner and look how close um, Verstappen gets to him. Here we go, play it again. Back he is, but he's seen a gap and he's absolutely dived into it. In fact, I'll just go back and play. Watch Hamilton's, Watch Hamilton's hands. Hamilton's hands. Turn your eyes to the screen on the right. Watch Lewis's hands here. And I don't think he expected Max to come this early in the lap either. Look at him having to take evasive action there. No contact on this occasion. And at that point, Verstappen. And no highlighting the fact that you shouldn't be taking evasive action midway around the corner because of the, unless you do, the other car's going to hit you. That's a problem. That contravenes driving standards in Formula One. No mention of that. Is up and away. DRS, of course, was disabled. So Lewis had to just use the old fashioned method of picking up a slipstream. Verstappen doing a little bit of weaving. And I, at race control, heard. Verstappen's engineer, Giampiero Lambesi, saying, watch the weaving. They didn't want to risk any chance of a penalty. Verstappen had good drive, good traction. But Lewis, in that slipstream, unbelievably, look how much he's catching up, despite carrying higher downforce. And they were... there. Look at that moment. They could not get any closer without making contact. It's incredible if you look at it. Heading down towards turn nine, six corners to go in this World Championship. And at that moment, it was effectively decided. It's got to say, it's got to be right up there with 2008 for the most incredible final lap of a World Championship, Simon. Oh, dear me. You know, they make comparisons with 2008, which was completely different circumstances altogether. And then what we get is people suggesting that 2008 should be ripped off from Lewis Hamilton because in one of them Grand Prix, Renault cheated and therefore you should cancel that Grand Prix rather than just disqualify the cheat in that race, which is what you do in every other event. You disqualify Renault. You disqualify Alonso gets disqualified because his team cheated to give him that win, which means Hamilton actually gets promoted from third to second. And... Massa in that race finished 13th because Ferrari messed up with the refueling rig. And then Massa had a shocker because clearly, psychologically, he uh, mount, had a meltdown. So he did 13th. He got promoted to 12th, but it's still no points. So that's all you do there. But what we do is, is the media are coming up with this oh, Massa can take legal action. Ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. It's all a narrative. It's all a narrative. And people need to start seeing through the, the shit. And we need to start waking more and more people up to this. Okay? Please look at where the videos, if you've not already done so. And please share them. To other Formula One fans 
that don't see the significance. They don't understand. They accept what happened in 2021. They need to see what is going on, the mechanism of what this media is doing to condition you to accept the fix. It's a huge fraud. They made so much money out of it by by manufacturing a champion, by manufacturing the drama to um, basically attract more viewers that gave them more money. Now, that's disgusting. That's not sport. That's a fraud. People that have put any money into the sport, whether that's through buying race tickets, whether that's through betting on the sport, whether that's through buying F1 merchandise, whether that is through just buying a TV package, your monthly Sky Sports package, to be able to watch it. You've been defrauded because what you're watching isn't a sport. It's been contrived. It's been contrived. That's fraud. And there should be, and there will be, compensation claims. So stay tuned. There's a lot, lot more to come on this. Thanks for your time. Um, and as I say, hit, hit subscribe to hopefully keep growing the channel. So hopefully it gets greater exposure so that more and more people get to see what they need to see as the reality of what's going on. Cheers.